So the Dream of the Rood is the last of our three Anglo-Saxon poems. And in this, uh, I'm going to break up this lecture into um, a couple of different parts. So um, they're not as long. And um, in, in this section, I'm basically going to talk about a little bit about the form, the background, some of the themes, and um, uh, lay out the structure of the poem. So uh, before we can really dive into the dream of the rude, I want to look at uh, the definition of a rude. What is a rude? Well, the literal, literal translation from um, Anglo-Saxon means tree. And sometimes this poem is called dream of the tree. Um, but that word or that translation of tree has been um, kind of made mo been modernized into the translation of, of, of cross. So essentially what we have here is a tree that has been cut down and been used to make the cross on which Jesus is crucified. So I'm going to use them kind of interchangeably, but for all intents and purposes, a rood is a cross. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to discuss a little bit about the type of genre or form um, that this poem, remember in um, the Wanderer and the Wife's Lament, both of those were examples of elegies. Well, the dream of the rude is an example of a dream vision. And a dream vision is both a literary device and a literary form. And that form is unique to the medieval um, period. And I'm sure that, that when you hear dreams, the, the first association that you have is, oh, well, when thinking about literature, is Freud, right? Um, and Carl Jung and all of this, you know, 20th century stuff. But really, dreams and um, these in, in visions predate all of that as far back um, to uh, the 10th, uh, the 10th century. And like I said, that um, this is a unique genre to um, the midi the medieval pe the, the medieval period because um, they were intensely the medieval people were intensely interested in dreams and their meanings. And this poem really kind of mirrors um, the the things that would be found um, in the Bible because the the Bible uh, and, and the Old Testament um, in particular is is narrated through various dreams, purported visions, um, and apparitions that are experienced by um, various prophets. And um, the, the New Testament is also kind of uh, features um, the, the visions of Paul and his, his, his visions of paradise and, and in the book of Revelation. So um, not to go off on a tangent, which I seem to have done, um, this medieval dream poetry is an incredibly popular um, in for the time. And for them, dreams, and, and in this literature, dreams serve as prophecies or revelations of inspiration. And it's really kind of a flexible form um, because it, It allows for writers to enter a realm which bends the rules of time and space. And, and because it's so flexible, 
Um, the form is, is used for a variety of purposes. It can be used as, as, as a form of consolation, advisory literature, which in some ways we have here because our poet is advising us to do something. Um, not unlike the wisdom poetry of the uh, the Wanderer, um, but it also allows for religious and philosophical explorations. And that's really what we have here. Um, so a little bit of the background of this poem. It is the oldest example of a dream vision poem in English, and it is found in the Vercelli manuscript and that's housed in Italy. So it is really old. And, <laughs> um, and it's kind of remarkable that it has survived. And that's really kind of the one of the reasons why um, I decided to teach this. I, I haven't um, traditionally taught this in this class um, is because I think it really highlights um, the one of the major kind of themes or or or. Um, elements that come from our unit and those are the pagan and Christian tensions and the conversion to Christianity is incredibly significant for the Middle Ages and the medieval period and moving into um, the, the the Renaissance and the Reformation because of its uh, that 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 firm grasp of Christianity in our nation or in the British nation um, impacts everything moving forward. So um, the, this poem um, describes the passion of Christ through the German Anglo-Saxon heroic code. So essentially what's happening here is you have a Christian story told through Anglo-Saxon language or Anglo-Saxon values. Um, so something that they may not understand in terms that they do understand. So what does the word, what do I mean by passion? Um, or what does the passion of the Christ mean? Well, passion in this instance is the crucifixion. And that is tied to this idea of suffering. Passion is the suffering of Christ, the suffering that Christ goes through for us, the common man. So here again, we have this idea that's prevalent in each of the poems that we've read this unit, this idea of suffering. Um, some other themes, uh, in addition to suffering, that come up in this poem include this idea of redemption, humanity, transformation, which I'm going to talk a lot about moving forward, um, penance, um, and atonement. And uh, before I even begin, I want to kind of talk a little bit about this transmuted um, idea of heroism that makes Christianity accessible. Um, because remember I said that this is, it shows um, the Christian story in Anglo-Saxon terms. And what I mean by that is I want you guys to think back to when we were talking about the marks of an Anglo-Saxon society. They were very much uh, rooted in their core value system was the this warlike war the, the honor for the warrior and the kind of uh, exaltation of the hero, one who goes out and fights and wins and destroys enemies. And the, 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 the power that comes with um, gaining territory and earthly treasures and riches. And what we have, I mean, it's a very violent um, culture and society and, and Fighting battles and defeating enemies is what they value, okay? So what this poem does is it really shows or kind of, of, of 
of reworks this idea of what it means to be a hero and what it and and what it means to go into battle so the modes of battle have shifted into these new tactics of submission rather than domination and because what because what a pagan society um, an Anglo-Saxon society won't understand about Jesus is that he willingly, uh, that, that willing sacrifice, he dies instead of fighting because death is a loss, right? So, um, that would have been seen as weak to an Anglo-Saxon audience. And, and the dream of the rood tells us there's a sense of glory um, in that new tactic of submission. And the poem really substitutes um, new characters and missions for the old. So where a hero would go and fight and win, um, we have a hero now who fights on behalf of sinners instead of a landlord or a landowner. Um, and instead of vengeance, um, Christ followers are encouraged to show mercy with a new task in mind. Instead of um, winning earthly treasures and land they are seeking the tree of triumph and so there's this new concept of heroism that guarantees um feasting in the joys of heaven rather than treasure or earthly riches and those bonds of comitatus um of a warrior to a, a, an earthly king um those bonds have been replaced um, replaced with um, bonds between um, a heavenly king and the new warriors of the cross. And it really, what it does is it, it, it extends the hero's journey um, in a way that is more accessible to everyone, to every man. Um, to be a being a hero is not just for the chosen few. Every man can can be um, a hero. So um, I'm going to talk more about that um, moving forward. But just to kind of outline the structure, I have a more detailed outline of the structure in Canvas. But what I think will make this poem kind of easier to break down and easier to understand is to understand the structure. And what we have in our structure, we can break it down into three parts. The introduction to the dream, the speech of the cross, and the dreamer's kind of final monologue. And the the main emphasis, the important part of this poem is part two, the speech of the cross, and that is sandwiched in between um, the words of this dreamer. So I'm going to stop here and I am going to pick up um, on talking about part one in the next video. So please, um, if you need to take a break, take a break. If you need to, uh, if you want to keep trucking on through, keep trucking on through. But part one um, is where we'll pick up.